Hey, everybody. Welcome. It is Friday, August 13th. This is Michael Bracey with the Music Policy Forum, uh, welcoming you to our monthly installment of Music Policy Forum Live, a conversation program about how we can build and sustain stronger, more resilient, and more equitable music ecosystems. Uh, we are, as always, thrilled that you're spending part of your Friday with us. We know that uh, everybody in this community is extraordinarily busy and has a lot of demands on their time. Um, professionally, not to mention uh, it's middle of August and, and we all are juggling family and other types of um, things that are all uh, in motion. What a month. I can't believe it's been a month since we we had our last program. And um, I have to say, when we left things off in July, I don't think I would have predicted uh, we'd, uh, where we'd be and what today's conversation uh, would look like. Um, but it is what it is. And this is uh, in large part why we do this program, to be a resource uh, for the community and to bring ideas and updates and strategies forward, uh, even when there are um, not really good answers on a lot of really complicated questions. So uh, for those of you who this is your first time joining us, welcome. I, again, we're thrilled that you're here. For those of us, uh, those of you who are watching our archive, I, again, thank you for watching the archive. Uh, some ground rules before we get into our guests and, and get into our updates. Um, first of all, um, again, thank you. Uh, if you are so inclined, don't feel obligated. If you're so inclined, uh, put your name and, and your location uh, into the chat. It's always fun to see where people are joining us from. This is a real international audience, and we um, we take that very seriously. Uh, we will be, um, this week particularly, I, I think there's going to be a lot of questions, a lot of back and forth. Uh, we'll be taking questions uh, in the Q&A window throughout, um, and we're going to really try to save the last 20 minutes of our program today. Uh, for some back and forth across uh, our different guests and, and with you in the audience. So um, please uh, take advantage of that Q&A window uh, throughout. Um, I'll say this uh, also, and, and, and we really haven't said this before, I don't think in, in one of these programs. Um, the issues I think we're talking about today are hard and emotional, and we're going to be talking a lot about the difficult decisions that a lot of people are faced with, uh, again, decisions that no one particularly wants to make. Um, I really hope and expect that for the next hour that we all uh, embrace the uh, willingness of our guests to come and, and be part of this conversation and share with you. Um, and, and part of what I mean by that is, is if you do feel like you have some counter views, if there's some concerns that you have, if you want to raise some, some other perspectives that then you're hearing from our panel, uh, we certainly welcome that, uh, but let's just do that in the spirit of um, camaraderie and togetherness and trying to muddle this through together. Um, and if um, we're having challenges or, or it feels like the conversation is going directions that that really don't feel great, we're just going to ask people to to leave the chat. So huh, Alex and I will, will be policing that, our, our uh, awesome producer, Alex Stolman. So with that as background... Um, and thank you, everybody who's putting your, your information in the chat. Great to see everybody who's here. Um, it has been a month. It's been a crazy month. And of course, we're going to be talking about the mechanics and the, the sort of realities of, of what's happening with the Delta variant and what's happening with the COVID spikes and, and how we're all navigating that. Again, most of you know, uh, if you're watching this program, or you're well aware of the work that we've been doing at Music Policy Forum through our Reopen Every Venue Safely or REVS initiative with our 18 pilot cities across the country that have been really trying to work as a group in real time to think about how do we do this? What does this look like? What does it mean to reopen as quickly and safely as possible? And how do we talk about it uh, with our key stakeholders, our audiences, our venue employees, our, our musicians? Um, it's been hard it, and it will be hard. Um, and, and, and we all wish it was over, but life is moving on. It's been um, remarkable uh, from, from our standpoint to see the leadership that's been asserted uh, not only by venues and some of the, the leaders who are going to be talking to this afternoon, uh, but to see artists like like Jason Isbell. I mean, Jason and, and many others just publicly putting a, a stake in the ground and, and, and just stating their position around uh, audience safety and safety for the, for musicians and the crew and, and taking that uh, into a public conversation. It's been fascinating to watch that happen in real time. And then we've got the broader context of stuff that, again, we always talk about in this program, which, of course, uh, is, is rooted in the intersection of, of music and public policy. We've said uh, since the beginning of this program, you know, going back to April of 2020, um, when the federal government spends money 
at a high level, it really is up to our community to understand where we fit into those investments. And, and it was that kind of thinking um, that really uh, helped, you know, was, was part of the thinking that Neva and other organizations, you know, really brought to the political conversation last year leading to the historic investment in the Shutter Venue Operator Grant. It's important to note, uh, and again, most of you were following this, this pretty, pretty carefully, um, Congress is on track to um, possibly, you know, maybe likely, you know, I think it's probably about 85% likely, pass a significant infrastructure bill later this year. Uh, the Senate got their bill through uh, this week. It's at about a trillion dollars, give or take. Um, there's a lot of complications as far as how that's going to advance in the House of Representatives and if it's going to be a similar bill or if the whole thing falls apart. But really, it's, it's quite possible that we're looking at another trillion dollars of federal investment coming down the pike uh, this fall with the potential, again, a longer shot, but a potential of, of another bill on top of that, which could be another trillion, if not more. And I raise that um, just to make sure that we are all collectively keeping our eyes on the ball with the understanding, again, that if the federal government is spending money at that scale, they're not gonna voluntarily just say, hey, music community, you want some more money. It really is gonna be um, an incumbent on all of us to think about what are the intersection points from our sector, what we need, uh, what we would like, uh, especially as we move into this very uncertain fall and the potential of additional closures and things like that. And think about where does that align with the goals and the ambitions of this infrastructure package. So keep an eye on that. Keep, you know, we'll, again, we'll have more uh, on that as, as, as we move into the fall. But that's certainly something that we're thinking a lot about here uh, in DC. So with that as background, again, welcome. And let's bring in Danny Grant to kick things off. Danny is, uh, of course, our uh, Music Policy Forum uh, board member, the owner operator of the Mishawaka Amphitheater in beautiful Northern Colorado, uh, the co-founder of the Reds Initiative. And it's been, it's been a month, Danny Grant. But I mean, how, how are, let's, let's start off. Uh, how are things in, in Northern Colorado? How are things at the Mish? Um, you know, things in Northern Colorado are fairly healthy and safe, I feel like. Um, there is a lot of discussion about the Delta variant and the impact it's having on our community. Um, it, there's a, a lot of PTSD, I think, from you know the conversations that are coming that I'm seeing in staff and in coworkers and colleagues where, you know, the is this possibly going to happen again? Are we, are we possibly going to go down this path again? And, and just the enormous um, anxiousness about having to, to go through that again with our staff and our crews are, is, is it's frightening, you know? So I think there's a lot of that kind of teaming um, amongst all of us, um, you know, but I think in, in Colorado in general, we've done pretty well with our vaccinations. We've got a pretty good, um, situation happening, but the risk is there. And, you know, we're all kind of posturing and figuring out how we're going to approach this with our staff and our customers and, and the general public. And, you know, I think it's going to be incredibly interesting how things play out when schools get started again in the next couple of weeks um, and where, where things go. But, um, you know, we've taken an approach of let's listen to our authorities. Let's follow, let's read, let's follow the guidelines. Let's just stay right on track with, with what's happening and support, um, you know, the scientists and the, and the lawmakers who are trying to keep us safe. So that's, that's where we are. Um, and we're just trying to be real conscientious about people's emotional states about this, um, offering, you know, hundred percent refunds to people who have decided they just are uncomfortable coming to a show. So we've rescinded all of our no refund policies and anything like that to try and encourage people. If you've been exposed or if you've, you know, or if you're not feeling well, or if you just honestly don't know if you want to be at a show right now that you don't have to be, um, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's crazy times. And you benefited, you know, I feel like Danny from a pretty productive relationship with Larimer County. Um, is, is that continued? I mean, as, as the level of communication and alignment continued with the county on the, on the public health side? Yeah. And I believe they're more ready now than they ever were back when things were, were happening at a faster pace. Like now they're very teed up to manage and handle things and they're feeling much more confident about their support systems and their communication systems and those kinds of things. So I've had more communication with them this go around than I did during, you know, the thick of it um, in, in the first phase. 
So um, I, I'm pretty confident that they feel like things are under control. It's an interesting push I'm feeling from them asking businesses to take the lead on some things, um, you know, especially requiring staff to be vaccinated and, and things that are a little tricky uh, to navigate in terms of, of how you want to be as an employer and, and the risk of losing staff people at a time when labor is at an incredible shortage. Um, so we've had a lot of good conversations about that. And I feel like, um, you know, time will tell where we need to go with those restrictions and those mandates. And uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we're going to come out of this in a better position, not in a worse position. That's good. That's awesome. So Danny, stick around. We're going to bring you back in after we, we uh, introduce everybody else. Um, I'd love to welcome in Donna Westmoreland uh, with IMP here in the DC area. Um, IMP and including venues like 930 Club and, and uh, the Anthem uh, down in the Wharf District. Um, also working with Meriwether Post Pavilion, Lincoln Theater, you know, just really uh, kind of the heartbeat of the DC music scene in, in many ways. Um, it's great to see you, Donna. Could you talk a little bit about, why don't we just set the stage for those who, who are not familiar with IMP? I mentioned a couple of venues. Just talk a little bit about your history, a little bit about what this company is. Sure. Um, thank you. And thanks so much for having me. Uh, IMP stands for It's My Party. Um, and it is the party of the owner, Seth Hurwitz, who started very young as a concert promoter, um, bringing the, you know, the first new wave bands to the Washington area um, and did that a lot at the 930 Club before he owned it. The 930 Club was at 930 F Street, small little club that um, ended up being the place where most of the bands that are huge right now cut their teeth. Um, at some point, we moved to a bigger venue and we went from 300 capacity to 1200. Um, and we wanted to build the best rock club in the world. And um, we'll, we'll contend that it might be. Um, then we took over Meriwether Post Pavilion and the amphitheater just outside of Washington. And we built the Anthem, uh, which we wanted to be the best big venue in the world. Um, we opened it in 2017 and we're hitting our stride when we, our stride got interrupted in March of 2020. So um, yeah, so we have these venues that we operate and it's keeping us, well, it was keeping us quite busy. And, and now we've been sort of starting to drink from the fire hose with all of the shows coming back online. Um, and the, I'm just talking to my colleagues, the uncertainty right now, it's, it's, almost more stressful, I think, than it was the first time around um, yeah. because we didn't know what we didn't know then. And now we know what the worst can look like. And so much of the decisions that we've had to make are driven by, we can't go back. You know, we, we can't shut down again as an industry. We can't, we, we can't shut down as a business uh, and, you know, and as a society, I don't think. And so what, you know, it's, it's pretty clear the things that we have to do to keep that shutting down from happening. And uh, for us, as we, it's kind of, it's just the, the conversations really started over the weekend and hit the ground on Monday. And, um, and, you know, we had enough acts say, we want to go back only. What are your policies um, that we said, absolutely. We'll do what you want. And we weren't at a critical mass or anything like that, but we, we decided, you know, we should do this. And, um, and generally I'm the one that holds the owner's feet to the pro progressive fire. Uh, but it was his call. Uh, you know, he called and said, you know, we got to do this. And, um, so we are vax only, um, and allowing a 72 hour negative test. Um, we're getting so many artists now that are saying, well, can we do vax only? and which we will do for them. And so now the question is, you know, we're having the conversation, do we just really rip the Band-Aid off and, and go Vax only? Um, and, you know, we're starting our first show like this on Sunday night, and I think that we'll see how that, it could be that the management of, of the proof of negative tests becomes unwieldy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so for practical purposes, as well as, for actually jumping in the pool all the way, um, it might make sense that we just go back only. It's been um, 
you know, part of the, 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 the complexity of the public policy side of this, we've talked about again for, you know, since the beginning is that, you know, not only are we dealing with, you know, uncertain science that's changing in real time and, and trying to understand who knows anything about anything, you know, related to transmission and, and uh, vaccine effectiveness now is, is, is a big part of the question. There also is this dynamic where you're dealing with data points that are resulting from what happened a couple weeks ago, right? So, you know, we see our caseload now, you know, I think this morning's cases, I think, you know, according to the New York Times, are 153,000 new cases, you know, and, and a lot of that is, is baked in from behavior from a couple of weeks ago. And so right. we know that now the decisions that are being made, that the music community is driving, and, and it feels like sports leagues are getting yeah. on board with this as well. And so, you know, sort of the, you know, the mass gathering industry, you know, taking these stands, you know, over the next couple of weeks, we're not really going to know the impact on that for a month or so. And, and we're not really going to fully understand how these things all all interrelated. It's, it's all super complicated, but I would love um, for you to reflect a little bit. I mean, IMPs had, I, I think it's fair to say, a complicated relationship over the last 20 years uh, that we've been friends with the public mm -hmm. sector, with government in terms of, sure. of how does government interrelate with you? And, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, part of the, you know, what I think is, is, is certainly a big theme over the last couple of weeks is, you know, the industry just saying, we're just going to lead. You know, yes. we're not going to be passive. You know, could you, I mean, speak to that dynamic? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, in over 20 years of, uh, in business in in a city, especially a city like Washington, um, there's there's friction. There's always friction, especially with nighttime businesses. Um, and, you know, our city has come around recently, you know, at, creating a, a position of a quote nighttime mayor and 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 recognizing what an economic driver um, nighttime businesses are. So we, we've, we have been able to progress into being um, a leader in the community. Um, part of that has to do with the critical mass of, of four venues, but um, but others of it is, is a recognition that $12 uh, for every ticket that's bought, $12 are spent in the area uh, you know, for a drink before the show, um, dinner before a show or after a show, something like that. Um, so, so we're, we're at the table and I was at the table for the reopen DC committee, which mm -hmm. was, you know, this, uh, what do they call them? Blue ribbon panels of, of, of people all trying to decide. And, and, and it was an exercise in considerable futility because our opinions mattered not Right. It was only driven by what the Department of Health said. And so we kind of felt like, what are we doing here after all? And when the NFL made its call, um, and I, I believe that they were the first for the NFL to, to make the call about if a, if a player is not vaccinated and the team, you know, has to take a buy or, or whatever, that they would lose money. I was like, this is awesome. And now... That it's our businesses who has had to sit on our hands during the whole time and, and had ideas about how we might be able to um, reasonably open and, and we're finally able to kind of drive that conversation, which is uh, extraordinarily gratifying. Um, I would say that the responses that we've gotten on social media for when we announced that we were doing this um, the vaccine mandate. And we also, by the way, did that for, we announced a month ago that our, our employees would have to be vaccinated if they wanted to work it out inside. We have opportunities outside, but they're not very many. Um, but we were hoping that that would drive and appears to have um, a lot of people to get vaccinated. Um, so yeah, so now it feels like we are able to responsibly contribute to the control of our fate and the control of our community's fate. Yeah. Um, and, and, oh, like I was saying on social media, I would say 92 to 95% support, um, yeah. for if, if nothing else, um, you know, maybe a third of the, the dissenters are going go vax only, you know? Um, so, so it, it, uh, it, it's a completely different feeling than we had the last time around. And, and I'm going to come back to this, Donna, um, we're going to bring all the other guests in because I, I, I'm just curious on that whole question of how 
you know, what those conversations look like. I mean, I, I, I don't know. And it's probably pretty triggering for a lot of folks just to do a deep dive into the 930 Club Facebook page. To see the dialogue, but it's yes. interesting. And, and, and well, again, let's table that for, for a few minutes. But I want I want to get at that question of how do we you know, what does it mean to, to, to engage with, with uh, customers that just think, you know, for ideological reasons, this is the wrong move. So, mm-hmm. um, and, and one thing I, I want to flag, and then we're going to ask Stephen to, to, to join the conversation and Don, will bring you back in, in a minute. But, um, you know, another thing about IMP's history and legacy, you know, certainly is, um, you know, really being a beacon of being an independent voice and, and being able to stay, you know, sort of in a rapidly consolidating marketplace and environment to be able to, you know, really, again, be a local leader and, and really have that strength. And I would be amiss if I didn't shout out the amazing work that Audrey Fix Schaefer has done for you for a long time, but yes. especially helping lead the communications effort uh, in the Save Our Stages Can campaign, you which, okay. you know, I've said repeatedly and happy to say again is, you know, my 25 years of doing this work by far and away the most effective and you know, inspiring, you know, combination yeah. of advocacy, policy development and messaging that, that I've seen, it just blew me away. And so yeah. Audrey deserves a lot of credit and yeah. I'm excited. I, I love your thoughts, Donna, on what is the potential of, you know, as we get past COVID of having this sort of national scale and collaboration organized and among independent music venues. Oh, it, it's, it's a game changer. Uh, you know, it, it truly is. And, and, uh, so many people resonate, the independent venues resonate so much with people um, that, and, you know, and we do a lot of business with Live Nation and Ticketmaster and with AEG, and I, and I don't want to disparage them, but, but when you have this, when you've heard of the cats and you have this collaboration of, of names that, um, you know, independent venues around the country that, you know, whether they're theaters, movie theaters, whatever they are, just, just these places that resonate with people and, and they're allied, you can get, you can get doors opened and, and people to come on board in a way that, that, you know, a big corporation with big money lawyers and lobbyists can't always do. And, um, and, and you can do that across the aisle too, which is what I think that they've shown and, and been able to experience. Well, no, a lot of us are excited to, you know, be thinking, you know, proactively and, and progressively about what the future is of our community as we get past, you know, this, uh, get past this catastrophe and this pandemic. And it's going to be exciting to see the continued leadership, not only of Neva, but of, of NITO and, and the local mm-hmm. organizers, um, which is a great segue to bring in Stephen Severin from Seattle. And Donna, we'll bring you back in, in a minute. Great. For our round table, but Stephen uh, wears 15,000 hats. I don't know if it's literally 15,000, but um, is a venue operator, a bar operator, and has been one of the driving forces behind the WANMA, the Washington Area Music and Nightlife Association, which uh, came together last year as uh, one of the best examples of a local organizing effort to speak with one voice and try to be coordinated and try to do this work well. Stephen, thanks for joining. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me, Michael. Yeah. All right. Now, what do we need to know about Seattle right now? So um, I do wear a lot of hats. Um, I was actually just talking with Mikey Lee, who is the king of hats. I probably wear more sneakers than anybody else (laughs) around. But um, uh, quick Background on me, I run a, a couple small venues. Numos is a 650 capacity room, uh, started originally in 94, ran for a few years and then became many other venues. And then it was reopened again as Numos in 2004. Uh, so had that for about 17 years. And then we opened a place called Barboza, which is a little 200 cap room. Um, I ran a promotions company for 17 years doing shows in every venue in the city. Uh, For 15 years, it was fun. For two years, it stopped being fun, having to battle Live Nation and AEG and losing. So I quit um, and went, I've opened some other bars. I ran a a festival for a few years. I worked with Bumbershoot for a while and uh, 
let's see, recently became a partner in a small ticketing company called uh, Venue Pilot, which is also a, a venue management platform with Justin Cantor. And when all of this uh, hit, when the pandemic hit, um, I worked with uh, all the venue folks around the state and created an organization called Washington Nightlife and Music Association um, that was helped because we live in the upper left coast and it is sometimes considered the wild, wild west. It's a very blue state. Seattle is a very blue city. I live in Capitol Hill, which is as blue as it gets. Um, we're as progressive as it can be. Um, the county that we're in, the politicians and the leaders are absolutely fantastic and do everything to support the nightlife industry. Our city is pretty good in that. Um, they could be better, but there are definitely people in there fighting really hard for us. And the state has really stepped up um, over the last uh, the last year working with Senator Cantwell and uh, Senator Murray. Um, mm -hmm. We formed Washington Nightlife and Music Association to figure out how the fuck do we get through this pandemic? We didn't know what we were gonna do. We thought we were gonna be shut down for three months. Um, and we formed a, a, another organization, a fundraising group called Keep Music Live. And over six months, we raised a million dollars for 80 venues around the state to help them get to that next step so that they could keep their doors open until Save Our Stages hit. Um, that's the fire hose of all, some of the things that I do. Uh, we opened back on July 1st. And when we opened, we were requiring vaccines or negative tests within 48 hours. We weren't very vocal about it um, because we didn't want the big pushback. 90% of our tickets are all done in advance. So when you went to buy a ticket, it said you had to have this stuff. Um, that went great. We didn't have any real issues. And then, um, we had nine bars in a weekend, all get, uh, people who work there all get COVID who were all vaccinated. And so we made a much bigger push to go out there and get all of the bars and venues to go vax only. Um, I'm following the science uh, I, I want to follow the facts. I don't want to fo follow what Chet, who talked to his buddy, thinks is the way that this is how the, the virus is going to go. Um, and so we worked with some different people, the Seattle uh, Restaurant Alliance Group. I forget the last SR something. Um, and now there's 150 bars and venues that are all facts required. Um, some of the venues have run into troubles. Um, Numos, we didn't have any problems. Uh, some of the venues have run into issues. My other small bar, Life on Mars, uh, caught hell. Um, we have been threatened to be burned down, blow our place up come in and shoot up the place. Uh, we actually reported it to our uh, local detective that we've worked with for a long time that understands the music industry. None of us think any of them are credible threats. Um, the only reason we actually probably went to the police is because somebody got a hold of our GM's personal phone number. And that was a little alarming for the rest of our staff. Mm -hmm. um, most people are ecstatic that we've done this artists that are playing are ecstatic i was just on a panel the other day with a bunch of um booking agents and most all of them want to go vax requirement there was only one agent who had an artist who his band didn't want to do it part of it was the style of music it was there's always going to be that um, but most everybody wanted to go VAX requirement. Um, that is what we're pushing for. We really are uh, starting to talk with Neva. I'm one of the captains of, of Neva of 
asking agents to come out and say that they want VAX requirements, but also the artists, as Jason Isbell did. Um, that was great. We need more of that. It's really great that New York City and LA and San Francisco, in my opinion, came out and are requiring vaccinations to go into public places. The rub I know is that there are a lot of states where it is illegal. And that is the conversations that we've been having that are very, very difficult. Um, I don't know how it's going to pan out. Um, if you can't go to Florida and you can't go to Texas and you can't go to these places, how are you going to route 30 dates? All of a sudden you're only going to route 15. They're going to, there's already, I mean, we're all hearing it. There are some tours talking about pushing back to spring um, from the fall. And that's not something that we can go through again financially or mentally. Because I know that everybody on this call right now is really tired. They don't want to be on this roller coaster anymore. The Save Our Stages SVOG grant is absolutely fantastic. It was designed to get us through a year. This is longer than a year. And now it's looking like it's going to go further than that. And even with the supplemental grant that we should be able to qualify, that still may not get us there. So. Um, we all know it's very tricky. Um, it has gone really, really quite well with the vaccination requirements here in, in Washington, um, for the most part. And, um, we're going to keep, keep pushing on that and, um, and deal with the, uh, the hiccups to come along. Thank you for, for that overview and, and something I want to you know, just really emphasize quickly is, is something that's been really re remarkable. Again, it, it, it you know, it, it's, it's, you know, we at Music Policy Forum have, it, how do I say this? Um, it really has been amazing through the Reds initiative to be able to have these relationships with all these, you know, leaders across these 18 pilot cities that are, again, all trying to puzzle through this in real time and see how different communities are, are, are trying to navigate uh, through different strategies and different approaches and in very different parts of the country and different, you know, very different political situations. And one thing, you know, just to build off of something you were saying, Stephen, that has been really an inspiration out of the Seattle region and, and has had a big impact in, in other REVs pilots coming out of the Seattle region is just the, the, you know, putting the mental health of venue workers front and center and really trying to foreground just I mean, everybody's hurting through this. Everybody's dealing with this as best they can, you know, but to really, again, try to be intentional about, um, you know, just the drain and the exhaustion uh, and, and the reality that for most people who work in the independent music, you know, community, it's not necessarily a moneymaker anyway, right? I mean, this is, you know, you do it, you know, out of service and out of community. And, you know, when you put these things on top of it and layer just the layer, the, the just levels of, of just stuff to navigate, it really is overwhelming. So I, I know that you and others were involved in uh, at least one, you know, sort of event to try to, you know, bring forward some of the issues for venue employees and, and some other work that you've done. And, you know, I just uh, really applaud that and appreciate it again, because it's really been um, really helped, you know, kind of take that to the national conversation as well. So, so thank you for that leadership. Thanks. So I'm going to ask you to stick around, Stephen, and, and um, we're going to bring in Nathan and Eric from Boise um, and, and the Tree Fort Fest, and then we're going to bring you back and, and, and finish off with some kind of roundtable conversations, if, if you don't mind. Nathan Walker, Eric Gilbert, it is awesome to see you guys and have you with us. You are coming from Boise, Idaho. You are in the process of putting together the Tree Fort Music Fest, September 22nd to 26th. So we want to talk a little bit about, um, again, your response to kind of what you're hearing from, from Donna and, and Stephen and others, just about how you're thinking about the sort of realities of putting on a festival in September. And then I really want to talk about specifically what you guys are programming, because we had you on uh, months ago to talk about Tree Fort as a concept. And now that's actually happening, I really wanted to hone in on that a bunch. So 
But why don't either of you want to just take it take it away, talk a little bit about just to just do the quick, quick thumbnail on what Tree Forward is and, and kind of how it fits into the Boise ecosystem, and then we can build from there. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so Tree Forward, for those that don't know, it is a multi-venue festival that happens all through downtown Boise. It's very walkable. Usually happens in March, but we punted our March 2020 festival all the way to September 2021. And our um, obviously that is what, six weeks away? It's 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 on the nearing horizon. So um, it, it primarily started as a um, multi-venue, multi-genre music festival, but now there's a bunch of other other things that we endearingly call other forts. So there's like a, a, like a yoga fort, a hack fort, a ale fort, food fort, story fort, and so on. Nathan, and we'll, I'll let him talk about that, but he leads our music talk. So we do have some like um, a decent amount of speaking programming and uh, so in the music policy, music industry sort of vein. Um, and as far as the status of things, I'll just say like Boise has been, you know, last couple months, you know, so we did a decent amount of pod style outdoor stuff here in Boise last year, kept it safe. Um, but there's definitely, I, I, and just kind of feel all the feelings of everyone that just spoke, you know, it's just like, it's been a really challenge because we've been getting this taste of reopening and everyone, you know, it's been a good reminder to everyone how important um, just uh, live e events are in general and live music. And so I, I, I do sort of feel, um, I feel good and sort of empowered like the rest of everybody here that, that this is worth, like, this is a different scenario than last year. It is, there's a lot of PTSD involved, but also we have a lot more tools in our tool belt. And, and I think it's, it's, it's really the great that the industry is coming together and showing that we can find our way through that. I know a lot of the way I address the public this week. So we announced on Wednesday that tree, tree port was going to be re requiring proof of vaccination or a uh, proof of a negative test. And then we're also going to be in collaboration with the health department, some health professionals going to be providing on-site testing, rapid testing and health screening just to give people some other options. But our hesitation on that has been the political side of it. It's been so politicized, especially we are in a red state. Those of you who don't know where Idaho is, we neighbor Washington, but we more reflect Eastern Washington and over to Montana and Wyoming politically, Boise being a fairly progressive city. So there's some interesting tension around that, obviously. Um, the hospitals here, what Nathan Craig, like two or three weeks ago announced they were gonna require vaccinations for their all their employees. And that led to armed protests outside the hospital. So obviously, from a safety standpoint, from a festival standpoint, there's other safety considerations as we considered this. Um, but I will then say that since announcing our, you know, had a couple of two of our best days of ticket sales, like it's obvious that our community, our, 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 our artists, the once again, majority of it has been really positive feedback. And it does feel like we're, the industry is making a pivot into like, okay, we can create a safe environment and that's what we're going to do. And if you don't want to take part, similarly, we're taking a very flexible re re refund po um, per perspective. And, you know, I, I feel like the testing is giving people at least an option to try a little harder. Um, so our perspective is if you don't want to come, that's okay. That's your prerogative. But the rest of us are going to create a safe environment for those that do, because we recognize that it, there's a lot of, public health concerns also go for the, you know, um, from not doing events at all. And so that's kind of really trying to, you know, I, I know personally I've been frustrated by the all or nothing perspective from sort of both sides of the conversation, right? There really has to be a way that we can do things, but we also have to do them safely. And around here, we hear a lot of like, there shouldn't be any restrictions, you know, but so anyways, that's the perspective we're holding, um, feeling good about it, you know, and, and um, it's definitely adding a new layer of complexity. I'm going to pivot to Nathan real quick, but, you know, also being just, we have so many other part, other partners. So we were kind of, we were pretty much the first one to kind of roll this out in the event space here. And, and, you know, so for me, it was, I, I knew we could sort of offer sort of a shot across the bow locally, and hopefully that'll help bring more of our venue partners along and stuff. And we're trying to create options for, if we can, I love what Seattle has done. Obviously we have a different environment here, but, you know, if we can get more of our downtown businesses and stuff to, come along i know they want to but they also are just afraid of the um blowback so mm -hmm. nathan you want to talk about music talks real quick and then also some of the other efforts you've been working on yeah um i think uh yeah music talks has been something that's been various forms throughout the beginning of tree four i think probably some of the attendees have maybe been panelists but um in or will be panelists this this fall um 
But yeah, I think maybe me sort of, I wanted to share is that we're trying to um, just because of where we're at, trying to push and encourage vaccines rather than um, make too many broad sweeping statements about uh, requirements as much. And so I was really inspired by this show and, um, and when Vera Project guys were on talking about some of the efforts they've done in Seattle about, um, about lobbying to get funding for, um, for vaccination and um, marketing efforts. So over this summer, um, you know, Eric and I put together a proposal on that front and um, kind of just send it around until we could track down where the, where the money might be to, to be able to fund something like that. Um, initially sort of started as a um, vaccine incentive component, but we were, we were told once we kind of found source of funding that that wasn't really feasible, um, that they wouldn't be able, I mean, we could, we could do it, but they wouldn't fund it with this, with any uh, sort of grant money. Um, but in any case, we did find out last week that they are, um, they're going to fund our proposal to um, essentially do a broad sweeping kind of vaccine mobilization, um, encouraging marketing campaign is the biggest component as well as um, being able to hire providers to do pop-up vaccine events. Which has really kind of been our approach to try to just um, get as many people to voluntarily do that um, in this area. And for, part of what we've heard from the state is that the that 15 to 25 age group has really been some of the most hesitant, um, just not because any sort of political reasons, even just kind of like vaccine lazy, just not wanting to make appointments or whatever. So we're trying to just remove those barriers and do what we can on that front. I think I'm so appreciate you you mentioning that Nathan and and I think that's so important because again and and, and thank you for you know the hat tip to the to the Vera Project folks I mean the, you know the idea of um, you know sort of embracing the concept that you know your community and I know Nathan you're particularly a leader in the all ages community right I mean you know them better than most in your region and the idea of trying to deploy resources to basically you know, say, I mean, it doesn't like, I have no, like, I, I think, you know, we need to be doing everything and we are trying to do everything. And, and so I have no problem with like, get a shot and get a, you know, get a whiskey, whatever shot for shot. I don't care. That's fine. Try it. But what I'm much more interested in are the things that you're describing, which are, what are the real partnerships the strategic partnerships to say that you've got insight into community that most others don't really understand how to talk to them. And that's what Vera project did in Seattle with their partnership with King County health. I'm so happy that you're doing that in the region. And I really hope and expect that the federal government will be doing more engagement with our community. Again, not just, and I'm not, again, I'm not trying to be disrespectful of, more of the stunt kind of things, because I think we have to be doing everything, but really understanding again, that if, you, you know, if we've, we've reached, um, and I have a lot of sympathy because again, nobody, we're all making this up as we go along, but if we've reached that threshold point to sort of redefine what is the carrot and what's the stick, you know, so if the stick is going to be, you know, things like, you know, needing to show your vaccine, you know, or your, your test, if you want to go to the club or you want to go to the show, I mean, that that's all going to be really effective. But then also continuing to do the other thing that you're talking about, which is the positive engagement of like, let's make this easy. Let's do peer to peer. Let's get y'all to want to do this so we can get to where we need to get to, because otherwise we're just not going to. So that's that's awesome. Well, I am uh, my wife and I are planning on being with you guys uh, at, at Tree Fort. We can't wait, um, especially since uh, people like Jesse Elliott have been on record for years saying this is their favorite festival everywhere. And, uh, and if people like Jesse say, this is the one to go to, then we can't wait to get out there for a few days. So we, um, we just can't wait. And, and I know Alex has put the link to the website into the, um, into the chat and hope that a lot of other folks come out with us and enjoy a few days in beautiful Boise with some great music and great people and yoga and beer and all the other good stuff. So uh, we're really looking forward to it. Um, and let's go ahead, Stephen and Donna, Danny, why don't you turn your cameras back on and, and let's just open this up back and forth. I know you all may have heard some things uh, in the conversation from other guests that you may want to ask or issues you want to raise. Um, we're going to kick off with a question from, from Graham Smith-White here in D.C. 
<sighs> with a, a, a very uh, appropriate and a very tough question, which is uh, curious to hear how folks are navigating full capacity mask mandates. So at, at Graham's venue down on the wharf in DC, they've been visited uh, by the health department over complaint. Uh, they had to stop the ban, made announcement for the stage multiple times, and Graham very appropriately notes that nobody goes to a concert to be responsible. So how are you, Stephen or, or Donna or Danny? Um, I mean, this is stuff I'm sure you're navigating right now. How do you deal with, maybe we can broaden it, not only sort of mask mandates, but just people doing what people do at rock shows? Well, I don't have a mandate to defend yet, so I'm looking forward to a day when the government steps up and puts that out there and I can defend that in the concert space. But right now we're just, you know, trying to encourage and hand out masks and, and those kinds of things. But I, of you guys who have a mandate going, how are you handling that? Cause I feel like people are even more one way or the other about it these days. We can't speak to it because we've only had one. Um, we had one comedy event and so that was seated and, and, you know, you can move your mask to have a drink and they weren't even drinking that much. So um, we, we have our first concert on Sunday night. And so we will see, but, but the DC mask mandate currently does not um, forgive band members for not wearing masks on stage and the like. Um, so we're working on, we're working with the government to try to get that done. I hadn't heard about the issues that Graham's had and that's, very disturbing. Um, and so there needs to be more dialogue. Unfortunately, I just can't, I mean, we expect we are giving out masks for people that don't bring them. We expect that we will have to spend some time policing it. Um, that just seems to be the, the way of the day. You can, everyone can walk down the street and see somebody with their mask below their nose and, you know, below their chin half the time too. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that it's going to be probably the worst part of what we have to do. And, and Donna, you don't, I'm, I'm going to say, and I'm going to voice an observation about the DC community and you can close your ears because I don't want you to have to co-sign what I'm about to say, but, you know, again, part of what we've been thinking a lot about in the Revs network over the last couple of years is our examples of what does it look like to, um, have proactive, you know, sort of solution driven partnership between public health, public safety and venues and, and other sort of music stakeholder communities. And, and I think, you know, Stephen, you can probably speak to this really well. Y'all are always dealing with a lot of complicated yes. stuff in, in Western Washington and Seattle, and there's no easy answers, but the fact that you've got contact people, you've got sort of a willingness to try to figure solutions out. You've got more dialogue, I think in the Seattle region, than most parts of the country. And, and, and I feel like maybe in DC, they could learn from Seattle again, not to say that everything's gonna be sunshine and roses, but at least there's transparent communication and some accountability to say, all right, here's a problem we're gonna do about it. Yes. Is that, yeah, I mean, Stephen, would you say that that's a fair assessment or just sort of how, did, what are those dynamics in Seattle that other communities could be learning from? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I mean, the, um... We have worked with our government for quite some years um, because we we were forced into it through policies that old mayors and people thought were great ideas. And the community, the, the music community leaders got together, starting way back with the organization called Jam Pack. Um, and started getting together and, and fought it. Um, I mean, the whole reason that I have anything to do with all of the advocacy now is because we had to start a, a group called Seattle Nightlife Music Association many years ago because we had a city attorney that uh, decided to shut us down because we had a mayor who created a three strikes and you're out uh, rule, which was excessive fighting uh, over service and excessive garbage. And it was aimed to shut down BIPOC clubs. And so we fought it and we beat it. And it was a year and some change. We fought city council. We fought the mayor. We won. And then we got the backlash and Numos got shut down for almost 10 weeks. They came in and 
changed our capacity from 712 to 280 because they said our capacity was based on not an aggregate, but all the different sections. And we had nothing but sold out shows that we had to keep paying on. Um, so once, so we've had this history of that, which has really helped. And once we got through that, all of a sudden elected leaders understood that we can reach a lot of people in their constituents and we can help them get elected. Once that happened, they started playing ball and they came to us and they were like, Hey, what do you think about this? And once we were able to do an economic impact study and show like, this is what we contribute to this state and to this County and this city, um, they realized like we actually do mean something. And the really interesting thing with the mask mandates is I wasn't going to open Numos until it was done because I didn't want to have to have my security going and trying to manage that. I cannot imagine being at the 930 club and trying to sit there and tell somebody to put their mask back on when they're about to take a drink. And they're like, well, I was just about to take a drink. After you get that first, second whiskey in you, then all of a sudden you're going to be dealing with different people. The duck club, those people are going to be like, fuck you. I'm about to have a drink. Like I really wanted to, as a, as WAMA push the vaccine requirements. So we didn't have to go back to mask mandates. I don't know if that may still be happening anyways. And if it's mandated, people will be more likely to do it. But I know right now at, at shows, I mean, there's hardly anybody wearing masks. They're like, they feel they're, they're required to be vaccinated. They feel they're safe. And there hasn't been any real issues. That's the bigger thing that's been interesting. My definition of an issue is you getting COVID and going to the hospital or getting long haul COVID. Just getting the virus, I think that's going to be something that we're all going to be living with for decades to come. But the big getting to the hospital, long haul COVID, that's what we've been fighting. And somebody wrote in the chat about uh, Lollapalooza, which I freaked out when I was watching it on my TV and thought I caught COVID just from watching it, um, was really, really encouraged by the numbers that came out. And again, I want people to follow the facts and not just the, the stories. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and I'd love to... Um... That's a nice, and I appreciate the comment from Christy just in support of, of Tree Ford. And, you know, I, I love Nathan and Eric. Um, if you could speak a little bit, building off what Stephen was talking about, when you're dealing with the city, I mean, part of my understanding of Tree Ford, one of the reasons we want to go see it in a couple of weeks is, is, is it really feels like a organic sort of 360 celebration of Boise community and culture, you know, by Boise for Boise. Have you had a sense of sort of, you know, investment from whether it's local government or the philanthropic sector or the other partners that really want this to happen? Or are they more like, if you can pull it off, pull it off, but our hands are washed? Or is it kind of a mix at this point? Um, they definitely want it to happen. I can say that, you know, and, you know, I'll just say those that don't know, I mean, Treefort, I think 2000. 15 to 17 was the cultural ambassador for the city, like the current administration had named us and funded, you know, provided funding. The Department of Tourism um, funds us at the local u university. So they definitely recognize the value of it. I think, you know, they, as far as the COVID stuff, they're pretty hands off right now. I think there's just the politics of it around here are pretty tough. Yeah. So they they were very thankful on Wednesday when we announced and, and made it really clear that no one told us to do what we were doing. We were doing this as a private bit private business to keep our attendees and our artists safe. And so I know behind the scenes, all the government leaders were very happy about that. <laughs> so um, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it does. And, and I think part of, you know, where, you know, I think part of the complications of the summer from, from our standpoint is that we were, we've been wanting to pivot so badly, right? I mean, everybody's been wanting to pivot and the pivot for us at Music Policy Forum is to get back to where we were in November of 2019, 
which is really getting ready to do this major push around, you know, how do we think about music ecosystems? How do we define their value? And how do we supplement, you know, sort of the economic frame that we've kind of been in, a, in an economic impact box for a long time and really pull music into what the broader value of music is, which again, is not economic, it's human, it's community, it's identity, it's celebration, it's mourning, it's all the things that music does, which is, you know, kind of essential to the human spirit. And how do we not again, put that into a lens where we're just like, you know, an entertainment option. So you play mini golf or you go to the rock show, you know, and, you know, we've, we've, and again, we felt like this fall was going to be the point that we could really start to accelerate those conversations again, but do it coming out of an experience where we have much more organizational capacity across the sector than ever before, you know, again, because of the work, again, of Stephen locally, of, of Neva nationally, et cetera, you know, Chicago Independent Venue League. I mean, all the great sort of organizing efforts that have really helped unlock this, this potential of working on a community-based collaborative sense instead of just being a zero-sum game, we're all competing, you know, which has been the dynamic we've been living in forever. So, you know, I raise it, you know, kind of the Boise questions in that, you know, like, like one thing I'm super interested in, I don't know, not to put you back on the spot, Eric and Nathan, but, you know, this notion of the Cascadia Music Corridor, I think is fascinating. And I don't know if you could speak to that at all, but I know Kate Becker's with us today and in the audience, something that Kate has been really passionate about for years. Could you speak a little bit about what that concept is, again, predating COVID and what that could mean over time? Yeah, I just want to say one thing I'm going to throw it to Nathan. I just want to say that to get better answer your question too, I think what we found with the city and other government entities, it, they now fully recognize the value of it and they just, they're open to leadership around it, right? And so that's kind of the, you know, what a lot of us do in this. I want to say like what Donna co commented, we now have a seat at the table, right? And so we take that seat re, um, from a point of responsibility. And so, yeah, we, and I'll, Nathan, why don't you talk about the Cascadia efforts and stuff and, and how we're interfacing with the city? Yeah. Things. Yeah. I think that as far as Cascade is, it's, you know, it includes uh, Alaska, Oregon, Washington state and, and Idaho and leaders there. And we've been meeting together, uh, working on, um, some surveys and economic impact studies. Um, the, but I think uh, a lot of the benefit to us is just being associated with with others in that um, region and being able to like uh, just kind of share back and forth and, and and like Eric said, get a seat at the table because we can kind of bring these associations and connections with others in the region. Um, so that's been great even and a huge Nathan, I'm losing you a little bit. Any, um, oh, there you go. Economic impact studies or anything. Well, and I think this is, I mean, you know, let me ask a big question for everybody that, that would want to speak to it. And, and Don, I could take it back to a DC context a little bit. You know, DC has been one of the cities and, and there have been many, many, many across the country over the last 25 years where it's been the independent music sector that has driven the identity and the, and the urban growth of the city and in ways that have not necessarily been valued or understood in terms of property values or in terms of the sustainability of a musical culture. I mean, certainly in DC, you know, if y'all haven't been to the 930 Club in the last 10 years, you know, I mean, get ready to see something you wouldn't expect. I mean, you know, the, the, the growth around 930, um, the anthem, of course, was was incubated inside the Wharf development. And we were really fortunate to take a delegation to to uh, the anthem back in, in our last event in November of 2019. But even in the H Street Northeast corridor, I mean, so the notion that music is always the driver, you know, of community as hubs of economic drivers but that again, tends not to be valued in a governmental context or protected, you know, or recognized. And, and I would love just, you know, maybe a, a closing thought from all of you as we think about, you know, and visualize this post COVID world that hopefully we're gonna get to, if it's not three months, it's next year, at some point we're gonna be into whatever the next normal is gonna be, you know, given the positive experience of the organizing efforts and the public engagement and the government work and the messaging and, what I would suggest is a higher visibility of the power of live independent music. What, where does that go? What would we like to see? Like what would be the next things that we would want to be able to take on as we move into the, um, you know, move into this next, next stage. Does anybody feel like they have an answer to that or any thoughts they'd like to share? I know it's kind of a amorphous question. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm ending on an awful question. That's you know I, I, I'll, I'll, honestly, I haven't had the brain space to think about fair dreams, fair, fair, um, fair. but I will tell you that what hasn't stopped in the course of this is the validation of your point. If I had, if I had a nickel for every commercial real estate developer that reaches out and says, I'm building a one block long development, I'm building a two square mile development and we want to have some sort of music venue anchor that, that it, they all see, it. Yep. they all get it and they all know it. And, and actually at the, at the Anthem, we are the result of a government mandate that there be one. And um, so it's real, it's there. And when the money guys know it, you know, it's fact. Um, and so it's just a matter of, of using some of those uh, facts to, to drive government. And, uh, you know, I, I think that we're well armed to do that. Thanks. I would add that boarded up windows in those new gentrified neighborhoods looks terrible. So yeah. maybe that will ring a bell for some of the local leadership. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? I wanna, yeah, I want to uh, quickly say, like, through the pandemic, everything has been, our entire world's got turned upside down. But the biggest thing that came out of this was the community effort to all work together. Um, you know, in our state, we all competed from 10 to six, and then we'd go have beers and drinks afterwards. We were fine. Now we're doing this on a national basis, and it's people that, you know, I've never met face-to-face -face before that I'll run through a brick wall for. Howie Kaplan from the Howling Wolf was out at my bar on, I don't know, Wednesday, and he almost missed his baseball game because he wouldn't get up to leave because we just kept talking about how great everything was. I mean, the community that we have built through Neva, um, which started everything, but beyond that, with all of our different chapters, his, it's unparalleled. And the thing that each of us, I hope, learned from that national effort is how important it is to take it local. Take it inside your state and use the people that go to your shows to help push your agendas. We all have these gigantic email and social media lists. And when we say, hey, you should support this or you should support this policy or this uh, elected official that's running for mayor is down to support arts. When you can get people like that it can make a huge difference long-term and it's a slog because they got 8 billion different things. I mean, I, I asked Dow Constantine for something and he got asked 1700 other things that day. I'm one thing and mine's the most important because it's coming from me and the nightlife industry, but he probably has some other important things. So that's sort of the big takeaway for me with this whole pandemic and the fact that I get to be with my peers in, at, you know, Donna, Donna has the greatest venue in the world. 930 Club, nobody touches that. Like I get to be on a panel with her and I get to spend time with the GOAT, Audrey Schaefer, who is the best. So uh, just appreciated being on the panel, hearing everybody's thoughts and uh, good luck pushing on. Keep, keep oh, thank you. Up. Stephen, that's a that's a great way to to close out, and and I, and I think you know just to build on that, I mean it 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 goes back to the stuff that you know we were talking about you know in 1999 when we started the Future Music Coalition. I mean it's it's you know up to our community to assert agency over the future structures that we're going to live under, and and this year has proven that through hard work and organization and bravery and all the other pieces that we have an opportunity. To not be passive, and 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 we are so excited to get a music policy forum about where does where does this take us? You know, where does this take our community? How can we really visualize what should be next? And and there's a lot of um, fertile ground for us to till once we get past this nightmare. And and again, one of the reasons we're so happy to have you guys today is uh, you all are, and others obviously who are not with us today are asserting that leadership and are helping drive you know what it hopefully 
you know, is going to be a meaningful piece of getting uh, past this pandemic nightmare and, and letting us get back to whatever the next version of normal normal life is going to look like. So apologies for my speech of fine, everybody. That's what happens when I take a month off. But it was so great to have everybody. Obviously, thank you to our guests. Thank you, as always, to our producer, Alex Stolden, who does such a great job behind the scenes. Thank you for the great comments in the chat. I was trying not to get distracted by them, but I uh, look forward <laughs> to going back and reading all the great comments. Um, questions, comments, suggestions, feedback, all that stuff. We really value it. It is really important to us. Hit us up anytime at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Um, the archive, again, will be up uh, early next week. And if there's something in this program you thought was useful or, or helpful, uh, please forward the link around to your friends. It'll all be uh, on our program archive at musicpolicyforum.org. And, and we will be back in September with another uh, edition of this program. Uh, and I can't wait to see Nathan and Eric and many of you in person in Boise in like six short weeks. So thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Be safe. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.